you have a bunch of friends on the shelves behind you. Can you describe them for us? I am covered with poop all around me. I have poop <laughs> over my shoulder, poop uh, by me uh, on the computer here. Uh, poop is so important. To, this is sort of my poop shrine. Could we suggest more personal hygiene or no? <laughs> what she's saying, folks, is she actually has uh, uh, dolls and puppets that are shaped like giant piles of poop, and they have a smiley face and eyes. So she's not actually covered in poop. Thank you for being precise there, Steve. Yeah, she, she is surrounded by poop in, in her room, I can assure you, but uh, doll poop. <laughs> poop emojis. Poop emojis, that's right. Yes, thank you. You know, uh, our microbiome uh, um, metabolizes the food we eat, uh, and those small metabolites get into our bloodstream, and they, these metabolites run the chemistry of life. So for the steps that we can no longer perform, if our microbiome metabolites filled in those gaps, then we, our ancestral mothers had reproductive success. And at that moment in our lineage, we um, exported that gene from our ancestral DNA to our microbiome DNA, which is why having a diverse uh, microbiome is so, so helpful. Uh, so we talk a lot about poop uh, in my clinics. We talk a lot about poop in my clinical trials. And I tell people, you know, I ask people, are you pooping rocks, logs, snakes, pudding, or tea? If it's pudding or tea, you need less fiber. So uh, cut back on the fiber, uh, cut back on the raw vegetables. Uh, if you're pooping snakes, that's perfect. If they get into your pants, you probably have to back off a little bit because that's, you know, socially not very helpful. If you're pooping logs very comfortably and easily, that's okay. If you're pooping rocks, you need more vegetables, more fermented foods, and more fiber. I, I think I may have shared with you, but if I didn't, you know, I, I know your fondness for nine cups of vegetables. And when I was writing The Plant Paradox, I, I said that, you know, when you look down in the toilet bowl, you should see a giant anaconda looking back yes. up at you. And my editor said, wait a minute, there was a movie called Anaconda where it's coming out of a toilet bowl, <laughs> and I don't think we want that visual. And so we changed it to snake, but uh, I, I credit you uh, with that passage in my book. So. Oh, perfect. I'm happy, to, happy, happy for that. All right, all right. So uh, what are the worst foods for people with autoimmune disease? Yeah, well, sugar... Uh, is really terrible for us all. It, it feeds the wrong microbiome. Uh, gluten and casein have a lot of cross-reactivity with uh, um, structures in our brain, uh, and that drives increased inflammation and molecular mimicry damaging structures in our brain and in our cerebellum. Uh, so th that's really bad. Uh, the third most common food sensitivity is eggs, so that's why I take eggs out. Uh, and then uh, soy can be a problem, peanuts can be a problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, in my plan, uh, I have sort of a staged process. So at the level one, we take out gluten, dairy, and eggs and ramp up the vegetables. Then I get progressively more restrictive as people are willing to go on a more intense journey towards health. Now, I know you're, you're a pretty big proponent of grass-fed meats, organ meats, uh, liver and gizzards. Where, where does that fit in with all these vegetables? Well, you know, I really like to have people um, get uh, organic meat, grass-fed meat, according to what they can afford. I really like them to have liver uh, once to twice a week. Uh, if they can find it, heart once a week uh, would be ideal. Oysters, mussels, that would be marvelous as well. Uh, when you get these organ meats, we get more fat-soluble vitamins, more uh, uh, CoQ in that meat. You get If it's a grass-fed animal, then you're going to get uh, vitamin K2, uh, particularly in that, in that liver. You'll also get retinol. Uh, and uh, if we're thinking, well, I can make uh, retinol or vitamin A from the beta-carotene, that depends on the genetic variations of the enzymes that convert beta carotene to retinol. Uh, and, and I tell my patients that if they have a uh, autoimmune illness, if they have a uh, cancer or uh, cancer dysplasia illness, 
that tells me that their enzymes that involved in making retinol are less efficient. And they, in particular, would do very well at eating liver. So in my uh, VA, we would teach people you know, how to make uh, green smoothies, how to make cooked greens, and we talk a lot about how to make liver uh, so it would actually be quite tasty. And by the way, you know, my kids uh, like liver and onions. When my daughter is going to make an exotic meal for friends, she will include uh, liver in that uh, meal. Yeah. So um, what do you say to the argument that um, meats in general are aging and beef, uh, red meats may contribute to cancer? Uh, I know you're from the Midwest, and that's where I came from. So, so if your uh, meat, if you have a really high protein intake, uh, you may be uh, increasing your mammalian target of rampamycin, and that is a pro-growth hormone. Uh, and so, you could be increasing your rates of benign and cancerous tumors, uh, which is one of the reasons I am not a proponent of the carnivore diet, because uh, you're going to have a high uh, mTOR. Uh, I would much rather moderate the meat intake. So compared to the paleo diet, the meat intake that I recommend uh, is actually quite a bit lower. Uh, so uh, I think meat is complete protein. It's good for us, um, particularly if you have grass-fed meats. If we're having uh, factory-farmed meat, that's a different kind of meat, uh, and it may be more inflammatory. Um, when, when people are looking at the research that says the TMAO – uh, is a problem, and, and that may increase atherosclerosis. Um, what, what they forget is it, it has to do with the microbiome. And is that, did that meat become harmful because the person was eating a diet high in trans fats and high in sugar, which changed the microbiome remarkably away from the type of microbiome our ancestral mothers and fathers would have had? Yeah, and I think there's some, you know, really exciting research that actually was, to the Cleveland Clinic's credit, uh, done partially by them, that there's components in a lot of extra virgin olive oil, balsamic vinegar, and red wine that paralyzes the enzyme systems of bacteria to keep them from making TMAO from choline and uh, uh, acetyl L-carnitine. You know, I, I think this is a this is a interesting but complicated story. If red meat was a problem, our ancestral mothers and fathers would not have had reproductive success. So, what what changed? It's not just the red meat. It may be what we're feeding our uh, conventional farmers. It's certainly what we're feeding ourselves. Uh, you know, if we're eating our uh, six cups of greens, you know, nine cups of vegetables, uh, we have a very different microbiome. Uh, and I. I think it's an interesting question that we're going to continue to tease out. For a person with MS, or for that matter, autoimmune diseases, what what sort of foods you know are good for you? And I think you've alluded to that. But what's your prescription? So uh, I want people to ramp up their vegetables. Uh, ideally, a minimum of nine cups a day. Now, if you're very petite and you're like only four foot ten, yes, it's it's going to have to be uh, somewhat less. Um, the greens. Um, have a lots of vitamin K and carotenoids, uh, which are critical for retinal health, uh, brain health. Uh, and there's more and more research coming out that vitamin K is very important in making myelin and very important to brain stem cells that are going to be uh, involved in making the cells that will be involved in repairing the myelin damage and repairing the synapses. Uh, so greens, incredibly important. Uh, the cabbage family, onion family, vegetables uh, boost the detox pathways. They also boost pathways involved in neurotransmitters. Uh, mushrooms um, uh, boost your natural killer cells, which are good for your uh, immune cell function. And then uh, the deeply pigmented uh, foods uh, are rich in polyphenols and antioxidants. And the, we have many, many studies showing that the more color you eat, the lower the rates of uh, dementia, lower rates of cancer, lower rates of diabetes, lower rates of mental health problems. Uh, and that we have some uh, great studies that have used even just a cup of blueberries uh, equivalents 
in randomized controlled trials that show in just 16 weeks or 24 weeks, we can get improvement in thinking. So those are, are uh, very powerful reasons to ramp up those vegetables. I encourage uh, fermented foods uh, and seaweed as well. Great. Where does olive oil play in your program? Uh, swim in it. Drink it. It's, <laughs> it's really good. You know, there are so many studies uh, that are, are show the benefits of olive oil for cardiovascular health uh, and for uh, brain health as well. I love uh, for people to use olive oil. I prefer that they use it cold because when you heat olive oil, you lose a lot of the uh, antioxidants and you accidentally make some trans fats in the skillet. So I'd much rather people um, bake, roast, steam, and then pour their olive oil uh, on cold at the end. So lots of olive oil. Um, I, I'm, I'm, all, and I'm very keen on ketogenic eating. Uh, I, I, I talk now that you can, you want to monitor your lipids and know if you tolerate a coconut oil or if, uh, if your lipids go up with coconut oil, then you're just going to use the olive oil uh, with your ketogenic plan. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's something I, I stress. Uh, I, I take care of a lot of people with the APOE4 mutation. Yeah. And, uh, uh, coconut oil, and I follow their lipids, and coconut oil, particularly in these folks, really makes their small, dense lipids go up, and they oxidize those small, dense uh, LDLs. So I'm... My, yeah, you know, I, if you're going to go on a ketogenic diet, and I have a lot of folks on a ketogenic diet, it's very popular right now, and they use lots of butter, lots of bacon, and they're not advising these folks to monitor their lipids. I think that's a disservice. Um, I, I think you need to know how your lipids are responding so you can sort out, uh, is olive oil what you're going to use? Uh, do you have to use uh, periodic fasting instead? Um, or are you able to use um, butter? Are you able to use coconut oil? Uh, it's a very important question. So you can start whichever way uh, your culinary tastes take you, but check your lipids, please. And then see, make, then you can decide which way to continue.